Thank you very much for attending this workshop today. This is our first guest artist event in the theater since um, COVID hit. So this is a landmark event and you are part of it. Thank you very much for supporting the arts here at Pierce College. And Danny Marshall is gifted in so many areas. He is a gifted teacher, a director, a set designer, an actor. And today he's coming in and focusing on storytelling. It's a workshop and he's going to share his craft with you, share some amazing stories. And uh, I love Danny Marshall. The college loves Danny Marshall and we are so lucky to have him back in and you will too. Let's give a round of applause for our guest artist for this quarter. So I'm, I'm going to teach you a word right now because uh, it's going to come up at least twice in the stories I'm going to tell you today. And it's, it's an important word, but it's, it's also a word that has lots of meanings. Uh, this m word can be used as a greeting to say hello to somebody, but it also can be used as, as a goodbye. But it's not the kind of goodbye where, hey, I'm leaving and I'm not going to see you again. It's really like be well without me kind of goodbye. So it's like, I'm glad I spent time with you and now I'm moving on to somewhere else. Uh, and, and it also can be spoken with somebody when you're uh, connected with them and in a conversation. And it's almost like a thank you and, and I'm glad to be with you uh, kind of remark. It isn't necessary, I'm from the Stilicum Indian tribe, which is here local and uh, this word is not necessarily a Stilicum Indian word, but it is a word that is used within the Puget Sound Indian culture. And this might be important for you to know. Uh, the languages within the tribes were all different. So my tribe had its own language, which was different from our closest neighbor so on the north, the Puyallup tribe, and on the south, the Nisqually tribe. They had their own language as well. Uh, but we did have common words that we could use together, and this is one of those. So, so your word I'm giving you today is aho. And so that would be like the first thing we would say when we would come together. So I'm going to say it to you, and you're going to say it back, and we'll move on from there. So aho. Aho. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, here with you today. And as uh, Patrick mentioned, I've got a long history of connection with the theater program here at Pierce College and it's been an exciting part of my life. I started getting involved in theater stuff when I was in high school. Didn't necessarily at the time consider myself a storyteller, but that's not how good storytellers are formed, not necessarily in the theater, because what we learn in the theater is how to read a script, take direction from a director. Sometimes we do, can do a one person show, but that doesn't happen very often. But you take direction from a, a director, somewhat freedom within that about how you move and perform, but, but really you're moving to places and doing stuff under somebody else's lead. Storytelling is much different than that. You have to plan out every part of that connection between you and the audience. Uh, individually. So every story is different based on the audience as well. But that's part of traditional storytelling uh, and, the, and the reason why we had storytelling to begin with. Because a long time ago, when you hear that, you know a story is coming, right? A long time ago, when the people were in longhouses together, uh, especially during the winter time, uh, they needed something to keep them entertained. And there would usually be a great storyteller that would travel around from longhouse to longhouse and bring those stories. And they would sit around the fire and listen and, and enjoy the stories together. But that story was usually never the same. And so if you've heard me tell a story that I'm going to tell today before, and you said, well, wait a minute, isn't that a little bit different than the last time? It probably is. Uh, one of the great things about being a storyteller is the story really becomes you and it becomes a part of, of the, the gift you're bringing to an audience and it probably is adapted somewhat based on the audience and the audience's participation. I do a lot of stuff with uh, younger age people, uh, like school tours and, and, and 
And sometimes they're more willing to participate in the stories than older audience members. We'll see, because I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to participate as well. Thank you for sharing in, in the aho with me earlier, because that will uh, also be something that we're going to uh, uh, include later on uh, in another part of a story. Uh, but storytelling and the magic of storytelling is that if you are the person that always found it frustrating to tell somebody the plot of a movie after you saw it, you're probably a good storyteller. That was me growing up. It's like people would say, what was that movie about? And I'm like, oh, come on. My answer is probably going to be two hours long, and that's if the movie was only an hour and a half. So, so if, you need to, if you want to know the, the total meaning of what the movie is about, you have to get everything in context, right? So this happened for a reason. And then this happened because this has happened. Wait, you have to know this other part first, or you're not going to understand what this was. There's, it's, there's no short answer to that. But that's storytelling. When I first started telling stories, the, the, and, and the first story I'm going to tell you today is the first story that I learned. Uh, but when I first started telling stories, I uh, tried to memorize the story from the per original person that gave me the story. And sometimes some stories you can get in writing. We do have some, you can find a good book called uh, Northwest Coast Indian Stories or Puget Sound Stories. And I don't know if they have it in the library here, but, but you can still find copies of that. And there are good stories in there. And so you can learn stories from the print too. And usually somebody's done a good job of writing down what that, that storyteller that they heard tell the story, what, it, what they said. But, but that's not the real story. The story is when you make it your own story. When you're told a story, then you're given a gift, and you can take and use that gift as a storyteller to share it with somebody else. So these aren't like things that you're forbidden to repeat. You can tell the same story as I shared today because that's the blessing of a story. The more it's shared, the more people are inspired by it. And the more learning that takes place, obviously, there was another piece of storytelling that, that I didn't mention. It wasn't just about entertainment for the people cooped up in the longhouse all winter long, but it, there were always lessons to be learned within the stories as well, and, and sometimes planned in there very specifically. Now, I'm going to be a little bit political with you for a moment, but, but that's just because, you know, in the social media world of today, we hear more about people than we've ever heard before. But I, but I also grew up with uh, another good storyteller in my life, besides my native storytellers. His name was Bill Cosby. And most people, if you hear the name Bill Cosby now, are going to go, oh, wasn't he recently on trial for some stuff? And, and there were some negative things that were out there. That's true. But, but Bill Cosby, you cannot argue with the fact that he was a great storyteller. And so, and in fact, as a, as a young man, listening and watching television shows called The Cosby Show, one of the things he always did was share a story about something. So if his kids were in trouble or, and needed to learn a new lesson, he'd say, well, let me tell you about the time that, and they were like, oh, come on, not another story. Didn't we hear this one before? Yeah, but it might be a little bit different this time. So listen up. All right, so the very first story that I learned was uh, a story performance from a man that was named Laughing Bear, and he was kind of a big old bear kind of guy. Uh, and he is really the one that, that inspired me to, to learn to make the story my own. I didn't learn that immediately. Like I said, I first tried to memorize what he had done and repeat it. And then later on, I realized there was much more freedom in making the story your own and sharing it with your own heart and spirit behind it. So this story is much different from when he first shared it, uh, but it's still from the same roots. So, a long time ago. This was actually a very long time ago. And this was so long ago that the world was nothing like it is today. We have many stories that tell about how times have changed, times when we used to be able to speak with the animals, times when 
the animals used to speak with us and with each other, and they were all friends with each other as well. Imagine that. But that world was much later than this time. That's how long ago this was. This was a time before even people could speak with each other. This was a time when the clouds around the planet were so low to the ground that the people all had to walk like this all the time. Oh, with their backs bent and their knees a little bit bent. And it took lots of different muscles that most of us don't have today to do. But they walked like this and they always walked with their heads down. And when they did, eventually they would run into somebody else because that's what happens when you don't watch where you're going. Boom, smack, and when they hit them, all they'd say is, ah! because they didn't have language at all at that time. And so it was all about that. People were walking around, crashing into each other every once in a while. Ah! Guess what? We called the people at that time the grumpies because that's mostly what they were, was grumpy all the time. Not only were the clouds pushing down on them, causing them to bend over and, and walk in a way that was very uncomfortable, it was wet all the time. We know what it's like to be wet in the Puget Sound, but this was so wet, people were dripping all the time. Their feet were soggy because the water was at least up to their ankles at their feet, and their feet were always soggy. It wasn't a good time. But the cool thing is, most of the time when, when the world is out of place and not in tune with what makes us happy and comfortable, there's usually somebody out there that has a good idea, uh, a way to make things better. And there was. This happened to be a young girl uh, who uh, was watching people move around and crash into each other because she just sat down. There she was, sitting on the ground, looking around. She didn't have to bend over because she could see what was happening. There were people all over the place, and she began to notice that nobody was doing anything together. They were all doing their own stuff. And she began to get tired of sitting on the ground, all wet and soggy, and found a log and decided she could sit on the log. And it got her up out of the water. And not only that, the log could float. And the floating log gave her another idea. She actually carved the very first canoe. So the very first canoe that was made was because she figured out that, hey, I could actually sit down lower and below the clouds and not really have to worry about that. So she made the first canoe and began traveling around and seeing all the people grumpy and mean all over the place. Puget Sound is a big place. We got lots of water and you can pretty much go everywhere within the water. And so she traveled around and she first took off and we're gonna call this that side over here the left, all right? Because it's on my left. And, and you guys are the middle and you guys are the right. But when she went to the left and met up with these people over here, she couldn't talk to them, but she wanted to make sure that she showed them something new. And so she said, all you have to do is push the clouds up, and then you won't have to bend over so much. And they said, Wah! and they just turned around and walked away. They said, wait, no, stop, watch, watch me. Look, look, I can push the clouds up, see what happens, and now I can stand. And they went, oh. And so they did. Finally, they figured it out. Yes, we can do that. Try, see what happens. Look, push, push, push. Look, now you can stand up. But two things happened. Number one, clouds are heavy. They don't look like it, but they are. You can't hold them up there forever. And while she was doing that, the people over here, the clouds they all came pushing down further on top of them, pushing them down further. And they even got grumpier. It's like, oh, oh what's going on? except for they didn't know how to say what's going on, but they were like, ah, clouds smashing down on us even more. So that didn't work out so good, but she took her canoe, paddled all the way across the sound, back to the right, and she met up with the people over there and said, all right, you know what? I know you don't understand what I'm saying. People over there, they were pushing the clouds up. Watch, you can do the same thing. Look, push the clouds up. Look, you can do it. Yeah. All right, look, oh man, I know it's heavy, hang on, hang on. I'm gonna go over here and see if I can get them to push too. 
Oh, man, they dropped them already. That's what happens. <laughs> and then what about these people in the middle? They were just kind of skating along, not having to worry about it. The balance in the world was kind of all right, right? Uh, they could see some changes were being made, but they didn't have any way to work together. And this is where that word comes in. Because she thought, you know what? We need to have some way to figure out that we can do something that brings us all together working at the same time. So she started in the middle and she came to the people in the middle and she said, all right, I'm gonna teach you a word. I know you don't know what I'm saying, but you can repeat after me, right? First part of the word is ah. Can you say ah? Ah, right? Second part of the word is ho. 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 So ah ho. Ah, ho. And, you, and you know what the magic of the word ah ho also does? It allows us to time our push and work together as a team. So when I say ah, everybody's getting ready to push. And when I say ho, everybody shoves as hard as they can. So try that and see what happens. See if we can all push together. You guys can't hear me yet, so don't pay any attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah, ho, look at that. All right, good. So you're gonna hear that again, and I might even get a team person to help. Will you tell them when it's time to push in the future and get them ready? All right, I'm gonna go back over here. So you need to learn this new word too. Repeat after me, ah, ho, ah, ho, all right? And when I say ah, ah, you get ready to push. And when I say ho, you push all together. So ready? Ah, ho, push. All right, great. It's working, I think. I think we can do this. Let's one more time over here on the left. Are you all ready? I think that the rumor is coming across the sound already, probably even ahead of me. You should know that we've got this new word we can all use together that will help us all as a team push the clouds up and get them out of the way. Can you try that? Did you hear the word, aho? Yeah, here we go, aho, look at that. All right, so would you lead the people on this side? I'm gonna go way back over here to the right. I've got two leaders now, and let's see if we can all do it together, all right? So, I'm over here with them. I've got my leader there, yeah. yep, and over there. And so, can you hear me way over there? All right, here we go. Everybody on all three sides at the same time. Aho, look at that. The clouds are up there, but guess what? We're still holding on to them, and they're still heavy, and we can't walk around like this all the time, can we? There's got to be something else. Well, one of the things that happened when I, hang on, don't give up. <laughs> one of the things that happened when I invented my canoe, I also invented a paddle to pull my canoe with, and I figured out that not only can I push with my hands, but I can use my paddle and push even higher. How about if we all do that? Let's, yeah, I know you don't all have paddles yet, but you can grab a stick off the ground, right? Everybody go ahead and let, relax a little bit. Let's try this one more time. Everybody reach around, find a stick on the ground somewhere and use that and we're gonna all use the sticks and canoe paddles and whatever we have and push one more time together. So already all across Puget Sound, all the people working together, we have our sticks ready. I better not see anybody that's being lazy here either, yep. <laughs> All right, because I'll tell you what happens to them. All right, so here we go. All ready? We got our sticks ready. I got my paddle. Ready? Ah ho! Wow. All right, good job. You know what? You can let go now because that worked so good that the clouds were shoved up higher than they'd ever been before. In fact, they're not even, they're not even a bother anymore. They're way up in the sky. We pushed so hard. They're up there and they're never gonna, well, they will come back, but they're never gonna come back down here and get us all wet and soggy and, and break our backs like they used to. So it seems like everything in the world will be better, right? People will now start learning languages, we'll build more canoes and, and we'll all work out things together. And, but you know what, the world's not as simple as that. There's always people that are doing their own things. And even during that time, there were a couple of hunters that discovered a hole in the clouds and they found that because they saw some deer jumping up through there and running up on top of the clouds. And they were up there chasing after those deer when the clouds got shoved down. So that's what happens when you're not down here working with everybody else. But these guys were on top of the clouds and they all got shoved up there too. 
And we can still see them up there. You look up at the Big Dipper, that's actually two hunters with their two little dogs chasing three deer that are still up there uh, running and trying to get away. So that's the story about the Grumpies and how we change the world together with a simple word. Now, that word becomes very important because it's also a way that we use to begin to share uh, our stories with people uh, from other tribes and, and around the Puget Sound. And uh, by special request, because this is actually one of my favorite stories, but it's not my favorite, but, but it, it is a great story. I'm going to tell you a story about, guess what? A long time ago. This story is about a leader of the Stilicum people in a time that was different than it is now because during this time there was much more interaction with the animals. We could talk with the animals and the animals could talk with us. Animals had relationships with each other uh, much different than we have today. You might hear people say something like, you know, my, my spirit animal is Grandfather Elk. Grandfather Elk was recognized as somebody who had great wisdom and longevity and, and strength and power and somebody you could go to and seek information for, from. During this time, though, when people got along pretty well together and with the animals, uh, there was uh, a leader in the Stilicum Indian tribe that uh, was loved very greatly by his people. They loved him so much they would do anything for him. Uh, and uh, he loved his people so much he would do anything for them. In fact, the true spirit of, a, of a, a great leader is what we call a servant leader. And so this is somebody that not just leads with direction and gives us a clear path to follow, but it's somebody that works with us in accomplishing the things that, that we want to accomplish. So this leader decided that he would accomplish something that had never been done on Puget Sound before. They were going to build the largest longhouse that had ever been built. And people would know about the longhouse from all across the land. It would be celebrated as one of the most magnificent things that had ever been accomplished. But he needed all his people to be involved in that, that project in order to make it happen. And so, called the people together, made a plan, and they knew it was going to be hard work. But they knew because they could bring in their relatives and friends from some of the other tribes local and around their area to help them that they would have enough people to accomplish this. So the people all came together. And it was very important that they came together to work because this longhouse was so large that some of the support poles that they used to hold the logs at the top were as wide as two men standing side by side with their arms spread. That's a pretty big log. First of all, we have to get that log to stand up on its end. And then we have the special artists that come in and carve neat things that are on that log. Sometimes up in the north, we call those totems. Uh, down here, we called them story poles because they all told a story. And it was really a pole that had been carved with a purpose. The story was in the carving. So people would get together and work on that, but it took all the people together. And then, of course, we had these great big logs that had to be lifted way up onto the top. And we're talking about 30 feet up, poles way up there, logs, and this is what they used. Guess what? Aho! And people would lift. Aho! 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 And they lifted and lifted and they built and built, and this long house was accomplished. While they were, some people were building and in the construction part, harvesting trees, bringing them in, and putting the longhouse together, making the planks for the roof and the walls, and everything else that goes along with that. Some others who weren't involved in the construction part were preparing for a big feast and a festival. Because when you accomplish something as magnificent as that, you have to have a celebration, no matter what. Big celebration. And the celebrations on Puget Sound were called potlatches. Potlatch ceremony was uh, a ceremony where everybody was invited to come, but everybody left with gifts. So that meant if we're hosting a potlatch, we have to have things to give to all of our guests when they come. And so 
they started preparing all kinds of food. Uh, one of the things that the Stilicum people were most famous for was the sea scallops that came from our water. They didn't exist everywhere on Puget Sound, but we had these wonderful scallops that you can't even get anymore today's world, but the sea scallops were, were all strung together on their, on their cedar strands and put up to smoke and, and dry, and, and the salmon was smoked and everything, and clams, and we even had crabs and, and all the other stuff that people loved from the sea, and the camas from the ground, and the berries that were all over the place at the that time. You know, back in those days, they said the strawberries were so plentiful here in, in the Stilicum area that you would think that the world was empty when people were out gathering the strawberries because nobody could be found. But strawberries are pretty special, especially these little teeny wild ones that have so much more flavor than you can ever imagine. They gathered all those things up and they prepared new baskets and blankets. Blankets were one of the most important things we had because they took so much work to get the wool to make those blankets. There was a time when we used to have little dogs that we got the wool from. They're not around anymore. But most of the wool had to come from mountain goats that didn't like to stand still when you were taking their wool. So you had to go and get the little strands off the trees that they left behind. And that took a long time to build a blanket. So if you were given a blanket, that was a very highly valued gift. But they made blankets and baskets and boxes and, and were getting ready for this big celebration. And the longhouse was finally completed. <laughs> And when that happened, the leader climbed up on top of the longhouse so you, everybody could hear him around the sound and began to share the news that people were invited to come. On top of the longhouse, he turned in all four directions and called out, All who can hear my voice are welcome to come to the great potlatch celebration to celebrate the magnificent new longhouse of the Stilicum people. And he did that in all four directions. All who can hear my voice are welcome. Come join the Stilicum tribe to celebrate our magnificent new longhouse. Everybody, all people are welcome. Come join us for a celebration, a potlatch in the new longhouse of the Stilicum people. And finally, one more time, Everybody who can hear me is welcome to come. Please join us, the Stilicum tribe, in the magnificent new longhouse that we have built. And after he completed calling out, people began arriving day after day. Some potlatches go one, two days, but this was going to be a long celebration. People came from all across the sound. Some people traveled for a week just to get there. And when they got there, the party was already going. Everybody was given gifts and presents and celebration. The best thing about it was people could sing and dance and tell stories around the fire, and everybody was having a great time. And the, the, the potlatch had gone on for two weeks at this time, and people were still eating lots and lots of food and, and stacking up piles of salmon bones in the baskets at the side because of so much salmon that they, they had eaten. But after this two weeks, there was a knock on the wall. Which was weird, because normally, I mean, when you have a potlatch, everybody's welcome to come. So, didn't I call out, everybody's welcome to come, what are you doing knocking? When you come to a potlatch, you just pull the blanket off the front door and walk right in, and everybody's welcome. So, what's the deal here? This is kind of weird. So, the leader goes over, everybody gets quiet, it's like, whoa. Somebody's an on. <laughs> That's weird. But he goes over to the door, pulls open the blanket, and looks out and goes, oh, nothing. <laughs> I guess it was just the wind. Everybody get back to your dancing. So people start dancing again, and he's turning around, coming back in, and all of a sudden he hears this, whoa, whoa, <laughs> it's me. Can't you see me? I'm down here. And the leader turns back around and says, oh, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there, dog. And the dog says, yeah, oh, I'm here, I brought all of my people. The dog leader from all the dogs across Puget Sound brought all his dogs with him, and they were all strung out behind him. And there he is, he said, hey, we're, oh, we're here. You said everybody that hears my voice is welcome, and I brought all my people for the big celebration. 
Come on, you know dogs aren't allowed at a people potlatch. That's not even, that's not, you know that's not what we meant. I said all people. We're people, we're the dog people. No, all regular people are welcome to come. Not the dogs, look, you're all muddy and dirty and it's like, you'll make a mess in here. Just, you know, wait, wait, hold on. I got these baskets of salmon bones. <laughs> here you go. Take these baskets of salmon bones. Go on out there in the forest and have your own celebration. But you can't come in here. So the dogs did. <laughs> they took the baskets and they went off into the forest. And well, you know, they enjoyed the salmon bones. That was good. But they were still grumbling and having, having their own little pity party out there too. One dog said, Hey, what's the deal anyways? You know, uh, I didn't they say everybody could come? I don't know about this. This is this is not right. We should we should just go back in there and just charge on in, right? No, 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 no. I'm the leader and you know what, let's just eat our dog bones here and 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 enjoy those and you know Well wait a minute now. <laughs> I think you're right. That, that that that's not fair, is it? And so yeah. They all started thinking that they we should do something about this, and and they said, ah, oh, you know what, we can't go busting in on their party, but you know what, here's an idea. What if we build our own long house? <laughs> yeah, nobody's ever seen a dog long house before. We'll call it the big dog long house, and everybody will say. Whoa, look at that big dog longhouse over there. And you know what? We'll invite all the people to come and celebrate with us in the big dog longhouse. And then when the people come, we'll say, hey, no way. This is for the dogs only. Get on out of here. What do you think about that? And so they agreed. They said, let's do it. <laughs> so they got busy building. And it's kind of hard for dogs to build stuff. So it wasn't as big. I mean, this longhouse was like only about up to here. But it was big for dogs. Dogs hadn't been living in long houses before, and they, they thought that this was magnificent. In fact, it was big enough for like 100 dogs to fit in, so it was still, you know, a big dog long house, that's for sure. And when they finished the long house and began to have the celebration, the leader of the log, of the big dog long house, he climbed up on top of the roof of their long house and said, Whoa, -ho, everybody, listen up! The dogs have built the biggest long house that the dogs have ever known. And you know what? It's a fantastic sight for everybody to see. So come and join us as we celebrate the creation of the big dog long house. And he did that all four directions, calling out across the sound. And dogs started coming from everywhere. <laughs> Mostly dogs, because the people weren't so impressed with the big dog long house. But the dogs started coming and they started having a great celebration. And in fact, it lasted for like two or three days and they were dancing and singing around the fire in there and having a good time. And as they danced and sung and had their party, they began to worry because no matter how long they were going, they said, we need to keep on going because the people haven't even tried to come yet. They just kept on going and they were about ready to give up. Because there was never a person that came to try to get in. But then, on the fourth night, there was a knock on the wall. Whoa! All right, we're going to show them now. They think they can get into our potlatch. They're going to find out the truth. So, dog leader goes over there, pulls open the door, and looks outside. And... I heard that you were having a celebration. Who can celebrate without Coyote? I brought all the Coyote clan and we're here to join in the celebration. Hey, aren't you glad we're here? No, 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 wait a minute, Coyote. Are you crazy? We had to take pegs and put them all the way around the inside of the longhouse. So the dogs, when they came in, they could hang up their tails and keep the place clean in here. If we let you in, what kind of mess is going to be had in here? Go away, coyote. We don't have anything for you. Just get on out of here. So, <laughs> coyote, he's not as easy, easy to dissuade as the dogs were. Besides that, he didn't get a basket of salmon bones to chew on either. So, coyote, he just 
wanders into the woods, but turns right back around and makes his way back right on top of the longhouse. And he gets up there. And you know what? Longhouses are built so that the smoke can come out through the top. All you do is move a board and make a smoke hole. And so all those boards are up there, strategically placed to let the smoke out. And Coyote started moving them, covering up the smoke holes. And dogs inside there, singing and dancing. Oh, yeah, it's a great party. But they had to go lower and lower to the ground because it was getting kind of smoky in there. And they kept getting lower and lower and they were just about down on their bellies by this time. And all of a sudden, Coyote up on top yells, fire, fire, fire. And all the dogs jump up and they run around in the smoke trying to see and they run into the wall and they grab a tail off the wall and stick it on and run out into the forest. <sighs> That's almost the end of that story. But <laughs> today, if you ever see two dogs meet, even if it's not the first time, you'll notice they're always checking to see whose tail the other dog has. <laughs> So, people built a longhouse, dogs built a longhouse, and not only that, the world kind of moved on in a happy way. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about becoming a storyteller, and again, I just want to emphasize, don't feel like you, if you hear a story that you have to take that exact same story and share it. You may not remember all of it. I'm going to tell you a secret. I almost forgot to tell you the part about the pigs inside the longhouse. <laughs> that ruined the whole story, right? That's always the piece that I almost leave out. So I found a great place to put it back in again at this time when Dog was complaining to Coyote. But if I completely forgot it, by the time Coyote's up there, you wouldn't even have known. I, I may be, it, it could have still worked. But it's no big deal, uh, as long as you kind of figure out some way to get the, the messages across. But we've done that before. So I, I um, my granddaughter uh, started attending storytelling with me early on in her life. And, and it's funny how, you know, both of my daughters were into theater stuff, but neither of them thought they were brave enough to come up by themselves and do a story. But... My granddaughter was, and so she's been able to go out and do stories on her own now. Uh, but <clears throat> we did stuff together, and like this, we would always catch each other on this one little piece about the pigs. So at the right time, early on, when the dogs were building the longhouse, that's usually where we put that in. Uh, and if one of us missed that, then the other one can, can, can put that in. Um, the other thing is, I'm going to say this because this is important for you to know about Puget Sound native culture. Uh, the people uh, in the Puget Sound were impacted very severely uh, by, by the non-Indians when they came into the area. Uh, there was a desire to uh, take the culture away from the people. Uh, the plant, we, in, the, in America, we call that enculturation, but that was the rule. The government really had a plan to to make the Indians into non-Indians and enculturate them or, or bring them in to the melting pot of America and make them just a part of the rest of the world. But the, the really cool thing is most of you have a cultural background that is a part of your life and you know that's always a strong part of who you are. And so for the Native American people that really didn't happen in the, in the fact that, that the, the tribes stuck together with their families, and, and sometimes we're able to continue to share stories. But, but most of the stories I have weren't because I had a grandfather that was able to say, hey, here's this cool story. I want to teach you this story. I want you to learn this so you can share it with other people. So we don't have that as much today. And in fact, uh, the first thing that the American government tried to do was take the language away from the people. And we're pretty successful at that. I'm going to tell you about four generations of people and that impact. Uh, my grandmother had the language available to her in the house, and she would speak that in conversations with people. 
But when she went, entered school, uh, they punished her for speaking her language and in fact encouraged the other students to punish her, act out and bully her uh, if she was caught speaking her language. And so pretty, pretty quickly she learned not to do that. And, and so the, the, the biggest impact for that is, are you going to teach your children what you had to learn not to do? <laughs> no. So, so next generation, my mother. Uh, she grew up in the generation of people that it's like, you're lucky if you heard or got to know that you're from the Stilicum Indian tribe. Uh, my family were always strongly involved in the, 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 the government of the tribe and, and, and tribal uh, gatherings and, and stuff that we did together. So we knew that. That was a part of it. But that, but that wasn't everybody. Not every family had that because uh, during that time, uh, there were also kids that were kidnapped from their house and taken off to boarding schools. The best way to avoid that was to not identify yourself as, as a part of the Stilicum tribe or, or one of the other tribes. If they didn't know, then they, they wouldn't take you away. So that, that happened as well. So mother's generation, she didn't get it. Uh, and not because she didn't want it, but she just learned that that was not how the, the tribe um, functioned today. So my generation, that's the third one down, uh, comes along and, and I've got some colleagues that have been working on language stuff uh, and it's been a very uh, important thing to bring some of that back. What I try to do is uh, incorporate specific words like aho and uh, usually when I talk about Puget Sound I'll call it the wolds so that's another word that we have so I'll try to put that in there. There are, sing there are words that I can use and incorporate in but I don't have the language, the part where I can have a conversation. I don't have a song I can sing you that's in my language either. Although I haven't tried to do that, it's just because I'm okay singing as dog and there's another story I tell where there's an evil ogre and he sings and it's supposed to be so terrible that, that some, you think somebody's dying out there in the forest and you go check on them. So that's okay, I can be him. <laughs> I don't have to worry so much about how I sound because of that. Although. I think I sound good. My wife would not say the same though, but all right. So uh, I try to incorporate those words in there. So here's my two favorite ones. And, and I'm going to tell you because it's really been the inspiration for me in putting together some new stories of my own. What do you think of a couple of guys named Scudzo and Squadzel? Scudzo and Squadzel. How about the adventures of Scudzo and Squadzel? Doesn't that sound like it would be, be better than Bart Simpson, I think. Uh, but yeah, there's so much potential in that. Scudzo is, is, uh, is squirrel. Squadzel, and you would think it's the different because of the Q in there, but Squadzel is chipmunk. So this is squirrel and chipmunk, Scudzo and Squadzel. So the, there's a great story that I learned that was about Scudzel and Squadzel, Scudzo and Squadzel's uh, war with the insect king. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that story right now. Maybe if we have some more time after questions and answers, I'll, I'll throw that, a piece of that in for you. That's not my favorite story, though. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. This other story, and I'm going to give you a little piece of it now, uh, is my favorite. Because there's not much that was written down about the true history of the people here some little we were, were able to capture and pass down. But I'll tell you, even my, my grandmother's brothers who were still in law, alive as I was growing up, if I talked to them about cultural things, remember that's the generation that was beaten for, for speaking their language. They would share some things with me, but it was more like, hey, here's this, this swear word you can use to say against some, somebody if you want to. Here's, here's a way to say a nasty name on somebody without them knowing what you're saying. That was, that was what they were into. But, but these, these are guys that were teenagers that grew up when the government came and shot cannons over our family house and made them move to, to give up the land that they had. So, so that was where they were at. But they're also the guys that taught me that you can't take the head off the smelt or the bones and tail off before you eat it. It's like the first time I sat down to eat, maybe that sounds normal to most of you, but most of the time we take the skin off <laughs> and the tails and the heads and we don't eat those. But 
But they, they scolded me the first time I picked one up and tried to eat it like the non-Indian would. <laughs> and I had to learn to eat it with the skin and the tail and the head. So uh, that, was, that was life growing up. Um, so uh, sometimes when you meet people, you have to understand that, that they're still learning something about their culture as well. Uh, I, did, I wasn't given most of this stuff. I had to go out and find out on my own as well. But I think that's changing now. Fourth generation, my granddaughter. Actually, that's the fifth generation. My, my daughter's kind of skipped in there a little bit. But, but, but they got the chance to do that too. And they saw the stories. They just didn't want to you know, pick up on doing that. But, but they're, you know, at least they have somebody that can say, hey, here's something that you can do. And she's inspired by that. So, so it's great. And she'll, she'll probably make some new stories as well. I want to write a little a comic book, at least, of the adventures of Scudzo and Squuzzle. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a cartoon movie would be, would be nice out there. These guys are not as mischievous as, as we saw with uh, Coyote, who is a troublemaker around Puget Sound and, and always does that wherever he goes. You don't want Coyote at your party, for sure. Uh, I don't know. In fact, I don't know what Coyote did after he covered up the the smoke holes and went down. I'm sure he went in there and just sat down and had a party all by himself. <laughs> so, Patrick, I'm going to invite you to come on up now because we want to uh, transition to uh, questions and answers. And, and Those were awesome stories. We've got to give a payback. We've got to give some round of applause. Those <laughs> So uh, you've learned these stories on your own, some of these stories on your own, and I'm just curious, the stories that were in, um, Danny put together this wonderful, he wrote this great play that was uh, produced here at the college, and it was called Stone Soup. Where did you find those stories? How did you learn those stories and put them together and turn it into a play? So two of the stories that you guys got to hear today actually were in the Stone Soup play. So uh, we, we put together a play that 2000, 2012, yeah. I think it was 2012. Uh, it was, it, the name of the play is actually, the full name is Stone Soup, a Stillicum Indian Story. Is anybody, not Stone Soup, Stick Soup. Stick, stick, stick. stick oh, Soup, sorry. a Stillicum Indian Story. So you guys have heard the story about Stone Soup. I mean, these are fables. Not everybody grew up with stories. I, I imagine that everybody grew up with stories like me. So did you get, not everybody got bedtime stories when they, when they were going to sleep. My mother was a great storyteller. So some of, some of my gift and desire to be a storyteller came from the inspiration that I got from her. But I knew all the stories. Jack and the Beanstalk, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, the American Fables. There's another one called Stone Soup, and it's really about the the uh, the traveling con man <laughs> that comes to a village with no food and convinces everybody that they're going to make the best soup they've ever had, and all they have to do is contribute together. And so he begins sending out the people in the village to bring a different ingredient. They all bring something. But he's got the magic stones that are going to make this the best soup they ever tasted. And so all the people bring the lamb, the beef, the carrots, the cabbage, all the ingredients for the soup, and they put it in the pot, and then he throws his stones in there, and they sit down and enjoy the best soup they ever had, and, and think it was magic. <laughs> Stick soup uh, was the idea that, that there is something that that ties us together around stories within the tribal communities. And the stick was the stirring spoon for a pot of clam chowder. And so for us, in our tradition, when families got together, there was a big bowl of clam chowder. And so we've got a, a little girl that is uh, growing up in today's world and also bullied for not looking like she's Indian because she's only part Indian and struggling with that and the impact on her life and, and, and prejudice from non-Indians and even other Indian people and, and angry about what's going on in the world. And she is about ready to sit down and, and have dinner with her grandfather who's gonna teach the family recipe for clam chowder. 
And she's got some responsibilities and brings some friends along to go through that. But here's the cool thing that happens in the story. In her anger, she's crying out. She goes to the smokehouse to get the bacon. She falls asleep and goes into this dream world where it gave us an opportunity to bring to life some of the stories. Like the Grumpies and, and the Grumpies that ended up being these people with these great big fuzzy suits on and they had these crazy looking clay masks that when people put their heads down the faces like stuck out with these awkward noses and stuff on them like somebody had smashed into somebody else and bent their nose kind of thing and it's like and the actors on the stage got to wander around and bump into each other it brought those stories together and, 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 and life to it that we hadn't seen before. And the, really the premise for that was I was looking for a place that I could take new storytellers that have learned to, to tell a story, and give them a place to perform, and had really tried to pick, put some kind of performance together. It was much like just a storytelling session, but we ended up writing this play. And so, so that and the, the Longhouse story was, was in there as well, and, and you had the people that played all the different parts and... and there's a couple other stories that are in there too, but so, so some of those were ones that that I had to spend a lot of time recreating. I didn't tell you that the, the first time I heard the Longhouse story, that was from uh, a lady by the name of Harvest Moon, and she's a Quinault tribal person. And, and early on in my storytelling time, and I asked, you know, is it all right if I tell that story? She says, yes, you know, I gave you the story. I told you the story. It's yours now. Tell the story. That's what you need to do. And so, so then, you know, it really was about making that into something different. Obviously, she didn't tell the story about a Stilicum leader. She told the story about a Quinault leader. So that was her story. Thank you. I have my little pseudo James Lipton questions here. So I'm going to, I don't have cards. I have it on paper. Um, and we've already heard from this, but when did you know that you would become a storyteller? And um, what is it that made you want to tell stories? What attracted you to this art? So, like I said, I've always been involved in, in theater stuff, and, and, and I haven't always been, you know, comfortable being in front of an audience. But, but initially, it's much easier to, to learn somebody else's lines, memorize those, and perform those as an actor, because then it's not like, it's not you, right? People aren't judging you for who you are. I think that storytellers are, are more like stand-up comedians who actually have to put together a, a one-person performance on a stage where, where the audience may judge them for the quality of, of what they're providing. But if you think about it, who are the best comedians that you've ever seen? These are people that are telling stories about crazy things that have happened in their own life. So, so I got to do some of that as a teacher here on campus as well. I used to teach communications classes here, and I always had great stories for everything. I, I really felt like, you know, Bill Cosby was an inspiration and in, in that here's, here's a story that might help you learn this concept. And, and that was part of what I did in my classes as well. And so if I was helping people learn about how not everybody sees the same way you do. You know, there's more than one way to see everything, multiple perspectives. Here's, here's an interesting one for you, and it would probably make a good stand-up comedian happy or proud to share this kind of a story. But, but did you know that not everybody falls out of a car and tells a story about it? I mean, I, I grew up thinking that, that it was normal, and so this is my perspective, normal for people to fall out of a car. Haven't you all had a falling out of a car experience? Matt says yes. <laughs> but, but you know what? I, if I ask you, and this is usually the case in my classes as well, how many people fell out of a car, Matt's probably the only other one besides <laughs> me, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so not everybody. But guess what? I had six kids in, in my family, and we all fell out, and not just once, but more than once. <laughs> Now maybe this has something to do with you know laws of change and people are a little bit more safe and we wear seat belts and and even if there were seat belts nobody wore them back in those days and and you know I grew up driving in the field with my little brother who was just a, a baby at the time we had a jeep that we would drive around the field and he'd sit on the seat we thought it was hilarious when he'd bounce off the seat and hit his head on the on the metal glove box because you know all the dashboards were metal they didn't have these cushions to for the the people that couldn't handle getting their head on hitting head or their head on metal 
<laughs> making a dent in the in the glove box. But anyways, we thought it was hilarious. I don't know how many times he smashed his head on the glove box. But we all fell out of cars, and it's like, and for me that was that was the reality. That was my world. So so you can get that right. It's like no, that's weird, man. No, people shouldn't fall out of cars. I remember specifically. You guys are from around here, so you know when I say South Tacoma Way, that's a ma major road going down there. I remember laying in an intersection on South Tacoma Way where there were other people running around because I was laying there on the ground in the middle of the intersection after falling off the, the, the back area of a Jaguar that my dad used to drive and really only had enough room for two people, but I'd sit up on the edge. He went around the corner, I flew out. <laughs> And I was just laying there on the ground, but I remember people all around me going, hey kid, are you all right? And I'm like, yeah, I just fell out of the car. Come on, <laughs> let me get up and get back in. <laughs> I'll tell you one, one of those that, that kind of made it real for me was when, so we used to call them work vans. You'll call them classic cars now. But in the old days, the classic cars used to have big old handles like this. They'd, they'd, they'd stick up like this on the side of the car and you'd grab a hold of that and pull that back to open the door. That's the way you exited the car. Well, sometimes that makes sense. It makes it easy when you're sitting there in the seat to grab that and pull it back and the door goes open. Well, we had the work van that had that kind of a door on it. We would not flip coins, but, but call dibs on who got to sit on the engine cover in the middle because that was not that was a seat as well so it's like in those days like the engine was there in the middle so i was sitting on that piece which meant that i was actually facing the back of the van my sister was in the seat because she had to sit in the seat which is weird because she was little so she couldn't even see out but i got the good spot sitting on the on the hump uh and she was sitting down there but when you sit down there it's like you just she had her hand on the door handle, right? So she's sitting down there, the hand on the door handle. And we go around the corner and I remember watching her because I'm sitting there like this. And I watch her and she goes like, we go around the corner. That means car's accelerating, pull back. She pulls back on the handle and it's like she's hanging on the door. And she's just like, the door opens and she goes <laughs> flying out. <laughs> and she's just hanging there and then she drops off and, and my dad's driving down the road. And I say, hey dad, there goes Kathy. <laughs> And he said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll go back and get her. <laughs> and that was it. That was normal. It's like, okay, don't worry. She fell out. We'll go back and get her. So stories, I think, have a good way of helping people on, understand context. So I've always wanted to use those to help people get it. Even when I, I shared about, you know, a movie. I, I was frustrated. I, I, don't ask me to tell you about that movie. I don't want to try and invest two hours of my time. <laughs> And you won't understand it unless I give you the two-hour version, or you won't get the same out of it. So, so it's it's I, I guess it's probably been in my heart from the beginning. I there's not classes. We don't have any classes here on storytelling. I I never got to attend a class. We did a workshop which, which I attended at Seattle Center because Seattle Center sponsored something called using traditional legends for classroom education. And so I attended that with two other uh, Native people who, who I grew up with since that time. And one was, a, 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 she's a lady that teaches language classes at the Macaw tribe up in Nia Bay, which is a long ways from here if you don't know where it's at. And Roger Fernandez, who now tells stories with me out here in the world as well. Patrick and I think we're gonna, we'll, we'll see. Roger, if you see this, we're, we're coming after you, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we, the three of us were there and, and, and at least got the concept of what it was to tell stories. I was still afraid. At the time, it's like, okay, here's my story. And it's like, I had it all written out and I still couldn't give up the paper. It's like, no, I might get something wrong. So at the end of the, the, the class that we did, we all got to perform a story with a puppet because we created puppets to go with these stories as well. And, uh, we were supposed to tell our story and I had my puppet and I was doing my story, but I had my script too and and I read it and they said that was a great story Danny, but you need to Get rid of the paper do it without it. I'm like, but I might get something wrong <laughs> I before I go to my next question. I don't want to ask you. Do you have any questions for Danny? Anyone in the audience have a question? <clears throat> Over here um, I work over in student success. I'm basically an advisor. Um, 
So I worked on a oral history project uh, when I was attending UWT, and I just wanted to know, does Stillicum tribe have um, like an oral history, like, um, like archives, things like that? Because I feel like storytelling really ties in with that as well. There, so that's a good question, and, and I think there's very little of that around. In fact, we don't have much of it, although I was privileged to work on a grant project that allowed me to, to go around and do some recordings. Uh, and, and I didn't get many traditional stories, but, but I did go around and meet with elders all around Washington State and, re, and had my cassette recorder with me and, and, and still have those. And I think we transcribed many of those as well. But, but that was like back in 1981, and so it was a long time ago. And 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 I, and I know most of those people aren't even alive anymore. So it's kind of neat to have that stuff. But there's not many opportunities that we've had to actually do kind of that kind of project. So people have to focus on, on what's going on in the world around them right now. For the Silicon Tribe, being a tribe that that was promised a reservation in our treaty, but never given one. But the promise is still there, right? Even Stevens, when he negotiated the end of the, of the Indian Wars, uh, he said, oh, don't worry about it. We're still gonna give you land, Stillicum Drive. It's coming, don't worry, don't worry. We're, we're gonna give you land in, our own, in your own area. Uh, but this is, that happened in 1854, actually 1856, when they did the Fox Island Treaty Council after the war, and we're a lot of years past that. Still coming, still coming. We bought our own place, Silicon Tribal Cultural Center, downtown Silicon. Um, that was because the, the elders said, hey, it's neat to show up in a classroom and tell students stories, but what if we had our own place to do that so people could come and visit us? So that's there. COVID cut down our volunteers as well. We're open, open on Saturdays. Should be open every Saturday, but I'm having a hard time getting somebody to be there every Saturday, so. Saturday 10 to 4. Check us out on Facebook, you'll find out if we're open. <laughs> Fred. Yeah, we know or we see so much with the totem poles. They're called all kinds of names, from story poles to a variety of different. What's the true meaning? What's the, what comes around that? Right. So those are great stories. I mean, great. It's a great question that, that brings up some great stories as well because we've got some totems here on on the campus. And and first of all, I, I want people to think of those as as pieces of art, works of art because that's what they are. There was an artist that was involved in creating that that piece and. And that's what it needs to be celebrated at most of all. Most of the time, a true totem pole, which doesn't come from the Puget Sound area, that's Northwest Coast, British Columbia, uh, even up into Alaska. Uh, but the people in that area actually did tell a story based on, on what character was at each position on the pole. There was a story that had something to do with, mostly with their family, but it wasn't a story that was shared like in conversation. It, it had a, a meaning that went with it, but, and, and so people would understand when they look at it, maybe it's the lineage of, of the people. But uh, mostly today, uh, there, there are carvings that are pieces of art. The ones that are here weren't carved with a story in mind. One is a raven pole this, that would be much more traditional for, we call it a pole, but it's like a raven carving. But it's about the same height as me, I, or Patrick's a little taller than me, more, more like the height of Patrick. So, so this raven carving is, is something that would, is, is really looks like something that would be more traditional Puget Sound. But here's the thing, Puget Sound art is much different than Northwest Coast art. People don't understand the differences there. That's another reason why I, I love some of the lessons that Roger has, has contributed to our understanding is he does true Puget Sound cultural artwork that, that what's the positive and negative within the, the designs within the artwork are different in the Puget Sound than they are in Northwest Coast. Northwest Coast stuff is recognizable. This is, this is uh, 
This is a carving that's got just basically some patterns in it. If, if you look at it, you might think seal. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, but nobody really told me that. This is something that I uh, have that was uh, from my personal collection that I don't know the, the background story on. But probably a seal, and then there's some traditional design that's a part of that as well. And so you'll see most of those same designs in there. But the, the answer is that appreciate the art. And, and, there's, and, and, and then the connection that that art has for the people that it represents. And, and if, as long as you make those two things, that connection there, because there's been some effort here. Patrick, we've worked together with a committee that, that has really said, how do we honor and respect the, the, the totem and the, the raven carvings here on campus? And it really was about respecting the, the artwork that was done there. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Is there a particular moment in your storytelling experiences that stands out for you? Oh, because I didn't tell you what my favorite story was. Um, all right. So, uh, best story ever because, and I started on this journey with you, but, but didn't actually take you the rest of the way. So, we, we did lose a lot of cultural stuff, but there has been some stuff written. And so, there was a missionary that, that uh, wrote down this story and died. It wasn't because he wrote the story down. That's not why I love it so much either. But he died in a canoe wreck on the water, drowned. But his journal was found later on. And the story was in the journal. And it was a story from here in the Puget Sound. Which, which is, we've got different variations of this story that are out there. But this one... Uh, uh, kind of represented for me as uh, like an opportunity where, where somebody really from back in the, the early 1800s first contact with non-Indians and Indian people here this guy was able to record this story that he had heard uh, in his words of course because now it's his story it's tell, told from his, his perspective and then we have that and so there it is written out and so there's a couple of different uh, titles for it uh, you can find it in a book, a children's book called Clamshell Boy. Look for that. Uh, or we call it Basket Woman. Uh, Basket Woman is the evil. So here's another place where I incorporate some traditional language. A Chiha is a Chiha is like a witch, and and uh, uh, I can't remember the one for the ogre. But this is the story where the ogre's at. That's her. Her husband, he's, a, he's an, just as evil and, and wicked as she is. His name is Nakatu. He's the guy that's screaming out crazy words, singing a song that sounds like he's dying. But anyways, the story is really about a mother who loses her, her child to the evil basket woman. Because basket woman is this crazy, long, scraggly hair, kind of looking like Medusa. <laughs> Uh, evil witch that's a very tall giant that lives in the forest and if you're not good you're gonna she's gonna capture you and pick you up and stuff her in her basket and take you home and she eats the kids for dinner so it's like you don't want that to happen so basket woman don't want to mess with her but anyways her daughter no her son no her daughter yeah her daughter gets gets taken by basket woman not her fault because of some other kids that were doing some stuff she loses her so she's crying out every morning and traditional stuff within the story you're not supposed to say the person's name after they die and that's not a custom that's really practiced today but but she's got a new son well not yet but anyways that's that here's the here's the crazy thing about this story so a magic boy is born out of her tears that's clamshell boy He's, he's birthed basically from her tears in the magic and the sand that comes from that and, and s saves the world and rescues his daughter later on. So that's, I'm telling you the end, of the that, there's the spoiler for you. It, it's a good ending, except for that's not the end of it. Now here's why it's a hard story for me. I love this story so much. It's my two hour story. It's like, I can't tell you that story. I just told you parts of it, but it's almost like not doing the story the value it needs to. But, but I wanted to be able to share that story, and I've done that a couple times. I have to, you have to, audiences, 
You know why you only have 50 minute classes? Because you can't, you can't pay attention for longer than 45 minutes. We've already gone over 45 minutes now. That's the attention span of people. <laughs> so it's hard. You got to take a break in the middle of that story. That, that story, I've done it. I, Patrick, I shared this before. I got to go to Puerto Rico as a part of an event by the university there where they invited people from all over North, Central, and South America, indigenous people. So it was the first gathering of the cultures of the Americas, they called it. And uh, the main pre premise was we were all doing performances based on things from our culture. Mine was storytelling, so I was there to be a storyteller. And I told that there, but here's the crazy thing. I love that story so much, and, I, and I'm telling it to middle school students from all over the island on this great big giant stage. The stage that we're performing on is the state, same stage that they do the Miss Universe pageant on. It's like I've got thousands of seats out there. <laughs> Anyways, it's full. And, and so we're there for a couple of weeks doing this. And I end up uh, with a fan base of little kids that are screaming and chasing after me saying, Pica Nino, Pica Nino. And I'm like, does anybody know Spanish? Somebody? Yes? What is Pica Nino? Child. child and pick it up just like uh, you know like yeah uh, take that uh, the child you know like taste it just take it so. oh so 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 somehow they they can that's that's the name they gave to the little clamshell boy who grew up that was grew up and became the, the hero in there but but they're chasing me forever so we're at one point out there and in the island where we're actually camping out there for the night and they all want me to come and tell them bedtime stories in their tent and so I it's not the same story because you can't tell a two-hour story for bedtime story <laughs> they wanted to hear that story again but yeah that's that when I saw that that was like you know what that needs to be shared people need to hear that story because it, it is it is real that's as real as history can get because nobody messed with that here's a journal from a missionary yeah that was discovered after he died. And, and so you've got that written record. And, and that doesn't happen very much. Because pe people didn't come here to record the history of the Puget Sound culture. They came here to live and take the land. <laughs> Is that the story that was published in, in the book? Or? A Clamshell Boy? Yes, that's the, that's the story that was published in oh, Clamshell Boy. Okay. In, in the kids format. So it, it's good. It's got lots of pictures in it if you want. And I don't think it's the two hour version. <laughs> So, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is for today's storytellers? I, I think that um, you need a mentor. So the biggest challenge is to find somebody that, that can help you get through that stage of, of, of how, how do you make the story your own and, and give yourself the freedom to tell a story. Even my granddaughter did that. And I know there's some of that that comes with age. but but. But she was like, no, I don't want to tell that story because I might get it wrong. I said, no, it's not, you're not going to get it wrong. Uh, you, you have to remember that, you know, how, how many times have we changed a piece in the story because we made it better based on the audience or did something different? I said, that's the new story. Or at least it was the story for that moment. And so it took her a while to get that point. And I, I don't know what it was for me. I, I think it was because I, I had a contract with a local government agency, and I didn't even remember which one it was, but they wanted me to do something during the, the a moon, the changing, some kind of a solstice celebration or something they were doing outside at night. And anyways, I had these stories that, that were kind of moon related that I didn't know. It was a new time for me to tell this story, but I had it all written out on cards. But here I was out there in the middle of the night. Now all of a sudden I'm realizing I really can't tell, I can't do this story justice trying to read this little card out there at nighttime and tell the story to people. So that's that. And the other challenge I will say is this. I'm pretty protective of, I don't mind people leaving now. Right? So that's, uh, that doesn't bother me because I know that there are schedules. But I've been asked to do stories at like fairs. And it's like, you can't, you can't do that. A story has got a beginning, a middle, and an end, likely. And it's like, and you're talking about people that are wandering around out there and find you on a stage, and they're listening to a part of the story. That just doesn't work. But I did that once, and I'm like, 
stories need to be scheduled, a scheduled event. I, I've had people ask me to come and tell stories at camp things and stuff before, and I'm like, that's fine as long as people are sitting, sitting down and serious about listening. I don't want yeah. people running around playing tag and, mar and throwing marshmallows at each other while I'm trying to tell a story. That's, so there's that piece of it, which maybe makes me a little bit more, it makes, makes my own challenge a little bit more there. But, and I don't know, maybe, our, maybe it's because in today the world, the, the attention span of the world is a little bit different. Yeah. My youngest granddaughter spends t way too much time watching YouTube stuff. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I am, I heard what you were saying about your daughter, how old your granddaughter, how old is your granddaughter? 18, or the youngest one is only seven. Um, She's the YouTube addict. <laughs> Where at? And, how, and who's the elective for? For teachers or for, for students? For students. Wow. Right. They don't know that when they sit at the dining room table and talk about the day, they're telling stories, you know, and even when they gossip with their friends, they're telling stories. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just wondering if through working with your granddaughter, I mean, if there's just some, some advice, I'm also going to ask you if you could come and visit, but I'll do that later. Um, if there's advice that you've given to young kids in middle school, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the the seven year old has come has has been brave enough to step up on the stage with us one time. But once she got up there, she was, and I, and I'm not sure where this comes from exactly yet. So I I don't have all the answers. But but her her fear definitely was had something to do with maybe she's not going to say the right thing, and and so she was kind of on the stage with me and her sister at the same time. So we found a way, so we tell another story about Blackberry. So Blackberry used to be a tree and, and the story about how Blackberry became the way he is today, but the animals overcoming the evilness that Blackberry became as he was an evil tree. And so there are all these animals that have these parts they play in the plan to take down Blackberry. And so we created a whole new animal. And so, so she all of a sudden had this kind of stage fright fear up there. And, and there's this place where, um, where Rabbit is doing some stuff, but, but she became Mouse. And we never had Mouse in the story before, but Rabbit's responsibility is to go up and kind of eat away at the roots of the, of the blackberry tree. And mice are good at that too. So she, she was quite happy to become this mouse that had nothing to say but was going around and eating the roots of, of blackberry and and that was her first experience she's probably getting closer to, to do that more so you're, you're right some are more natural her older sister who's 18 now uh, was seven when she first started telling stories and was able to just jump right in there and, and make stuff up so not everybody can get that I, I would think that the the younger one I'm talking about now is, is closer to that now because she's always doing that online. She's telling stories all the time. And this YouTube stuff is what's made her more of a storyteller than anything else. But, but there's not an audience the same. I, you know what? We did some stories during COVID without a live audience. It's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's definitely hard. But for her, I think she would rather do it on a camera than, than with an audience. Maybe that's it camera put them on camera so let them see themselves be successful telling a story on camera first and then Christine it's nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Thanks for so I have one more question how has storytelling changed you so so 
it's made me more comfortable telling people stuff that I think is important because my mother was the leader of our tribe before me and, and she, she always kind of pushed me towards that. I mean, I knew, I, I dreaded going to, to official meetings with her because she would say, all right, now I'm gonna call on Danny to give us a report on, and I'm like, you know I don't wanna do that, but she would make me give these public presentations. Uh, so teach, I've taught public speaking and communications speeches that one of the things I helped students who had that fear of stepping out and doing that is, when are you the most comfortable uh, talking to people? It's about the stuff you know about, right? You're, it's like you have no problems, like whatever. Maybe it's what you had for breakfast, a simple story, right? Uh, what, you know, what you did yesterday with your friend, what, what, you, what you saw on your way to work, what you saw, it could be a tragic thing, could be a happy thing, but there's lots of things that you know about, and when you know it's something you know about, you're good at, at sharing that. And so coming to that place where it's like, hey, don't be afraid to talk about the things that you, that you feel are important. My, my very first role in a play was King Creon in Antigone, and, and it was a massive role that had like two pages, lines that were two pages long. And, and, and the, the tragedy of that was that, that the guy that was cast in the role was completely failing. <laughs> And, and, and the drama teacher said, we're going to cancel the play unless somebody else volunteers to do this. And I'm like, oh man, I could do that. I'd love to do that. But I wasn't willing to say that out loud. <laughs> but the guy sitting next to me heard me say it and he said, hey, Dan said he'd do it. <laughs> and so there I was. And, and within five days, I had to memorize all the lines and be ready to go. And it was, it changed me more than anything. It was like, Wow, I can go out there. I got to be really angry in that. I mean, spitting angry. Sorry, I feel bad for Antigone, who is my co-lead in the play. I spit on her every night <laughs> because we were, I was pulling her hair and yelling and screaming. It's like, and it, it was fun. You know, I, I, I feel like, well, not the part of that. It wasn't fun because I was pulling her hair and yelling and screaming, but it was fun acting in front of an audience. And... Um, I feel like I feel like I'm a really good actor, but but here's the other thing. Besides COVID, which is really messing up people's minds, and they've actually done some research now that says people are going to have memory issues because of COVID. I had it twice, by the way. So that's there. But as you get older, you can't remember as much. Uh, the last time I acted in a play, uh, we did a play here, an outdoor pageant called. A place of first that was a summer performance that we did and we created the play and, and performed it out in the field behind the college and and I had the lead role in that but there were again it was these long massive lines that had no connection with somebody else and so it's like I remember that that I would have a place it's like I don't know what comes next <laughs> It's like, I don't have a cue from Patrick sitting there says, feeding me a question so I know what to say next. It's like, I just had to, this long narration that had to go off. And Fred was directing the, the play. And he, I remember that first night that that happened when, during the performance. He came, and who messed that up? What are you guys doing? Who was supposed to come in at that part? And, and everybody was not saying anything. I said, I'm like, that was me, Fred. I just, I, I was thankful that the little kid that was like only nine years old that was playing one of the camper positions. And he said, hey, well, what happened during this time? And I'm like, that wasn't even the line. But when he said that, I realized, oh, yeah. <laughs> He thought it was their fault, but no, it was me. So it gets tougher to do that stuff. But, but here's the cool thing about storytelling. You don't, you know what? You can forget to put the pegs on the wall and figure out where to put that in later on uh, to give the good ending to the story. Build the experience for the audience. I have one more question, and this is very selfish of me, but I'm going <laughs> to ask, where can I get a bag, a little packet of silicon flower seeds? Hmm. Because I want them in my yard. Okay, so, so usually the first question we get when we're asked about the culture of the Silicon Tribe, people want to know what what does Silica mean? What does the where does the name come from? That's always a a big thing. Silicon is 
is a word in and of itself, and it has a meaning. It means people, obviously enough. <laughs> but, but it's like, how, you don't really interpret it that way. It's like, because Puyallup means people as well. So how can Puyallup mean people and Stolica mean people? Well, it's like, it, it's like if, if you're Hungarian, what does that mean? It means people, right? It's the, it's the people. So it's the people from an area, really. So, so part of this story is that a long time ago, sorry, I have to hit my drum. <laughs> a long time ago, uh, there, the, the land around Stilicum was just flowing with these pink flowers. They were everywhere. And so it was, it was the people where those pink flowers were. And so, I mean, kind of in a, a weird, chaotic way, it's like, it means the pink flower people. <laughs> or it could just mean flower people. But, but that would be like saying Puyallup means the mud people. Because Puyallup was, like, that's where the muddy water is. And, you know, if you know the Puyallup River, it's not really mud, but there's a lot of silt in it. And it, it looks muddy. So, so that's, that's what that meant. It's like the people where the muddy rot water is. So it's like, they're not the mud people, we're not the flower people. But the silicon flower, they thought it was extinct and they've done a tremendous job, job bringing it back. They found out that it's one of those plants that only grows in community. So that's why it was wild across the things. It grows plentiful together. But if you take one plant by itself, it dies. And so they've done well bringing it back. They found this like patch out on Fort Lewis because Amazing enough, even though that's still a lot of Stilicum tribal land out there, and including my home, my family homestead, which, which I, I've checked with soldiers, and they still see houses when they, they march out there in the fields. But yeah, that's where it was at. That land has been untouched for a long time. And so there are places. They got the plant back. There is some place where we just got some, some more of the plants. You can't grow it from seed, really. Oh, okay. But you can grow it from the plant, and you can get some of the plants. And, and I'll make sure you know where to get that from. Thank you. We just got some more of it yesterday. So I'll, I'll let you know where that's at. Okay. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed learning more about storytelling. We did. We did. And, and I'm looking forward to doing some more, Patrick. Let's do it again. All right. A round of applause.